Hello all, so I thought I'd just revise exactly what we've done up until now, just to make sure it really makes sense. And then I'll sort of summarize the core idea behind what we're doing, because the thing is the core idea, because there's so much going on, there's so much terminology, because every little thing is kind of important along the way, um, it's kind of easy to lose the core idea. So I thought I'd just do a quick summary. Effectively, you always start off with two things. You always start off with something that you currently believe to be true, which remember we call the null hypothesis, okay? And then we test it against an alternative hypothesis, okay? And remember, there are three types of alternative hypothesis for the mean, okay? So you can either have that the mean weight, the true mean weight is actually not equal to 100 grams, in which case it's either less than or it's greater than. Okay, so it's either less than or it's greater than. In which case we call that a two-tailed test because we'll be looking at the probability that a sample will lie in the left or right tail. Okay, so either greater than or less than. The other option is that mu has got to be greater than 100 grams, so it's more than 100 grams. Okay, in which case we'll be looking at what's the probability that a sample will lie over here, okay, towards the right tail. Okay. The third option is that obviously the true population meat is actually weight, mean weight is actually less than 100 grams, in which case we'll be looking what's the probability that a sample lies over here, so it's left tailed, okay? So what do we do? Well, we go out and we collect a sample, okay? So we go out and we collect some sample data. And the example which I've used is um, we go out and we select 50 things and we find that the mean weight of those 50 things is 100.5 100, 100 grams, okay? So 100.5 grams. And let's suppose that this, this sort of true population, true um, population standard deviation is known to be two grams, okay? So then what we need to do is we need to think about this curve. So we're looking at this one, okay? We're looking at a two-tailed test. We look at this curve. We assume that this is true. So we put the 100 grams in the middle. We then look at what is the probability that this thing here lies in one of these two tails? So what's the probability that the, the chance of getting this sample is so small that we can say, hmm, that might not be true anymore. Okay, so we're looking at what's the probability that ends up in one of these two regions here. Now the region over here and over here, we call the critical region. Okay, so we call it the critical region. It's simply the region where if a value, if a, if a, if a value over here, li so if our sample value lies in one of these regions, okay, so in either one of these tails here, then we say it's critical. We say that this is significant. In other words, we can reject the null hypothesis, okay? So it's called the critical region. Now, how do we determine the size of the critical region? Well, we determine it in relation to this thing called the significance level, okay? So remember the significance level is how significant do you want your test to be? So significance level, let's just suppose that our significance level is 5%. But like I say, you can change this. Obviously, if you increase the significance level, the chances of your sample lying in this critical region, in other words, rejecting the null hypothesis, is higher. But you notice as well that by increasing the critical region, sorry, yeah, increasing the critical region, increasing the significance level, you're also reducing the confidence level. In other words, you've got less confidence in this test, okay? Because you're allowing more data to creep in, right? You're allowing more data to creep into these critical regions. Um, likewise, if you decrease your significance level, you decrease your critical region, then you're basically saying there's a smaller chance that your sample will lie in this region, okay? In which case your confidence level goes up, right? Your confidence level goes up because there is less chance that your sample will lie in these extreme values now, okay? So remember, it's just a trade-off. Now, if um, it will always say in a question what your significance level should be, but if it doesn't, it's up to you. Now, I would say 5% is a pretty standard um, one to go for. But like I say, you can choose 1%, you can choose 10%, you can choose whatever you like, okay? So this is the critical region, the probability that something will end up in here. So in this case, your critical region for a two-tailed test, the area has got to out to 5%. So you split it equally, in which case this area is worth 2.5%, and this area is worth 2.5%, okay? You can then look in your tables to find, well, what value corresponds to 2.5%? And if you look in your tables, the value that corresponds to an area of 2.5% is equal to negative 1.96. So you're using a Z-test here, negative 1.96. 
So you're basically saying that if your test statistic, if your, if your sample which you collect, your sample data you collect, if that mean, if that sample mean, lies more than 1.96 standard deviations above or below the mean, then you can say that it lies in the critical region, therefore your data is significant. It's extreme, okay? So this is what's known as a critical value. And there's two critical values here, okay? There's one on the left, and there's also one on the right. Okay, so 1.96 is the measure of the units of standard deviation above or below the mean in this case, because it's a two-tailed test. Now, if you do a left-tailed test or a right-tailed test, there'll just be one value. There'll just be one critical value and one critical region. And the area of that critical region will be worth your significance level. So the only thing you have to be aware of, if it's a two-tailed test, and you can determine that by the alternative hypothesis, um, if it's a two-tailed test, you need to split your significance level equally. Okay? Then you just simply ask the question, well, okay, where does this value lie in relation to your critical regions? So what you then need to calculate is this thing called a test statistic. So your test statistic is the thing which you use to test. Okay, and you just simply calculate it. You just simply calculate it by using your normal curve. You just simply say, well, okay, how many standard deviations above or below the mean does this lie in relation to your sample mean? in relation to your population mean, sorry. And you do that by taking 100.5, you take away your supposed hypothesized um, null hypothesis, okay, so your population mean, 100, and you divide by your standard deviation. So your standard deviation is gonna be two divided by root 50 by the central limit theorem. Okay, so you stick all that in your calculator and you should find that that comes out as, if I can find it quickly, 1.77. So that is your test statistic. You're basically saying that 1.77 lies about there. So in other words, this sample, this sample here, the probability of obtaining this sample would lie there on the probability curve. In other words, it doesn't lie in the critical region, therefore this is not significant. In other words, the probability of getting this sample is not small. It's actually fairly big. In other words, it's bigger than your significance level, okay? So because it's bigger than your significance level, it means that you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? If it did lie in this critical region, then you would reject a null hypothesis. Okay, so there's two options if you like. If I just make a quick sketch of this. It can either lie down here or up here. In which case, if it does, you reject the null hypothesis. So if it lies up here, or if it lies up here in the critical region, you reject the null hypothesis. If it lies in this region here, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now I'm just gonna put accept H1 here. Of course, like I said in my first video, you never accept anything. It might just be easier to remember if you just remember it as accept, but you never accept anything. You never accept anything. So in this case, because this data is not significant, then we can say, because we fail to reject the null hypothesis, then the true mean weight is probably 100 grams, okay? The true mean weight is 100 grams. In other words, we can't have enough evidence to say it's not 100 grams, okay? So just be aware, test statistic, critical value, critical region, significance level, there's a lot going on here. Null hypothesis, two-tailed test, right-tailed test, left-tailed test. There's a lot going on here, okay? But the other thing we also need to remember is the p-value, okay? So just remember, the p-value is the probability associated with getting this sample. And remember, because when you go to your tables, your tables are cumulative. In other words, they're looking at a region which is more extreme than this value here. So you always look at the probability. So another way of obtaining the of interpreting the p-value is it's the probability of obtaining a value. So the probability of obtaining a value or a sample more extreme than the one you currently have. Okay, so it's the probability of obtaining a sample which is more extreme than yours. So by more extreme, it means lying in this, lying to the right of this, okay? If this value came out as negative, in other words, it laid over here, the test statistic lied over here, then the more extreme value would be to the left, 
okay? So it's always in relation to the tails, okay? It's always in relation to the tails. So the p-value is a measure of probability, and it's the probability that if you were now to go out and collect another sample of 50 chocolate bars, what's the probability of obtaining a sample which is more extreme than this one? In other words, it lies to the right. Obviously, that probability is small, then it means that this is a more significant sample. If that probability is big, then it means this is a less significant sample, okay? So it's all to do with the probability of obtaining this sample here, okay? In actual fact, you calculate it by going here, you find 1.77, and you find it's 96.16%. Remember, it's cumulative, so it's everything up to that value. You want the more extreme value, so you're gonna be looking to the right. Okay, because that's the more extreme probability there. So you can do one minus that, which comes back as about 3.84%. Okay, so in this case, it comes back as about 3.84%. Now you might say, well, hang on a minute, 3.84% is less than the significance level. It's less than 5%. Surely that probability is significant. But it's not, because if you think about it, we split that probability equally amongst two tails. So because it's 2.5% and 2.5%, then we say it's not significant because it's greater than the significance level in this case is 2.5%, okay? If you like, what we should have done is multiply this p-value by two, okay? Because it's a two-tailed test. So that's one kind of correction that we can make for a two-tailed test. We have to multiply this value by two, okay? Because we're splitting the probability, the significance level equally amongst two tails. Or simply, you just halve the significance level. Either way, it's the same result. So hopefully you're clear now between the difference of a null hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis, the three different types of tests we can do, a test statistic, a significance level, a critical region, and a critical value, and a p-value. What all of those things do, okay? And notice the language as well, we either reject or we fail to reject, okay?